Good morning, everybody. Um, well, what a privilege and joy it is to be uh, here with you all and to be following Howard and following Victor and, and bringing our own piece of the puzzle to the, to the table. What, what I'm going to do with you is to share some of the work we've been doing as the Food and Land Use Coalition over the last year. We're working towards these big questions of how do we create a food and land use system that actually works to deliver the health outcomes that we want to see, the environmental outcomes, and critically, the poverty-related outcomes as well. There are billions of people living in the countryside, and that is where poverty is now concentrated in the world. So let me start by just reminding everyone of the extent to which the food system has actually done, in its own terms, an astonishing job over the last 50 years. Right, and one of the challenges that we face is that while all of us in this room go that there's something profound that needs to be fixed, when you go out of rooms like this and into the world, you will see another picture. Right? And here's what the other picture is, just to remind us, which is actually we've never had more food in the world than we have today. Right? We have never been better at growing food at scale and delivering it to billions and billions of people. Right? We are continuing to push up yields a bit every single year. Right? We add more inputs and we get more outputs and we do it reliably pretty much every year. Right? We keep on driving down the real price of food. And this is an understatement what you have here because as people's Real incomes go up in many parts of the world, and real food prices come down. The share of household expenditure in many, many countries, on average, and that's a very dangerous expression, but on average keeps on declining, right? And so we all spend a bit less on food, but we think we can afford more. And then, of course, on some measures, even though the last year or two, the undernutrition numbers have bumped up a little bit, as a percentage of global populations, they keep on coming down. So when you talk to people outside this room and you say to them, my goodness, we've got a massive problem in the governance of our food system, we need to transform the whole thing or it's all going to blow up, they go, tell me one more time what the problem is. Why are you guys banging on about the need to change this when I've got 15... It's not that they say there's nothing wrong, Right? When you go to ministers of finance, you go to leaders of big business, you go to a range of different people in ag ministries, they don't say there's no problem. They're all working away, but they don't, know, they don't go, this is the top problem, this is one of my top three that I must fix. Even when you go into the climate community where I spend a lot of my time, the history of the climate community is it's about energy. And making the link between the food and land use system and the energy system isn't a natural act. Right? So you go to the health community. In my country, in the UK, and you ask a very simple question, which is, of the thousands of hours that you get trained as a new doctor right, in the UK, how many of those hours are spent on what you eat? Right? And the answer is less than 0.5% of those hours, right? And yet we all sit here going, my goodness, this is the most important thing. If you can't get what you eat right, then you're not going to get health right. So I just want to remind everyone that the picture out there is, yeah, there's some issues, and we care about those issues, but, but tell me what the crisis is one more time. Why are you guys banging on in this room? So let me try and offer an answer to that, which is part of the work that the Food and Land Use Coalition has done. And it's very simple, which is that um, when you do the numbers properly, and I think Victor offered this language of externalities and internalities, um, so these are the numbers behind the words, right? And there's a problem with all numbers, which is at some level we live in the trillions and, and nobody can connect the trillions to the specific microeconomics. But the reality is that when we look at the big numbers and properly do them, this is what you get. And I'm going to run you through them quickly, because um, uh, I have five minutes and nine seconds left. Um, but um, the core of it is you take the market value of the 
food economy, right? Top to bottom, right? From the farm to the fork, right? And it's about eight to 10 trillion. The reason it's eight to 10 is that people can't agree on the definitions of what should be in and out, and, but it's in that range, right? Um, so it's the, these are directional numbers. Um, we will be putting out in three months' time numbers that you can quote. So don't quote these ones, but these are roughly right. They're good enough for this conversation, for sure. Um, but then you knock off the things that we know are the costs of the system and the way in which it operates today. So there are huge problems with non-communicable diseases already. These are not the 2030 numbers when these numbers explode if we continue on current trends. These are today's numbers, right? The millions of people that have stroke and diabetes and heart disease as a result of the kind of food that we are creating in the food environment and that drives their choices. We then have, of course, the whole undernutrition, the stunting and the wasting and the loss of lifetime productivity, and not just productivity in an economic sense, but the chance to lead full lives, right? And it's another one and a half to two trillion when you do the maths, when you take the millions, the one in five kids in the developing world, do the maths, add them up. You then take the climate piece of the puzzle, which is roughly 25% of emissions, and some numbers go up to 30% if you go end to end, including all the food waste and the processing of food, right, in the kitchen, turning on the heat to cook the food, right? That's part of the food system, right? You do the numbers and you get to 25% of emissions and you put a carbon price as a simplifi simplification and you get to one to two trillion dollars of costs. And those of you that think that climate crowds out the other environmental concerns of biodiversity and soil, which um, Victor rightly pointed to, 24 billion tons a year of topsoil that's lost, right? let alone all the degradation that happens, the water issues, I could go on, it's another one to two, and then then back to where I started, which is rural poverty. So we've got a huge problem because the reality of the true economics of the food system is that at best you can give yourself a plus four and, it, and, and probably conservatively, the food system is destroying value and destroying welfare across the world at astonishing scale, right? The governance of the system does not work and it is fundamentally out of control. Now, if you thought that was disturbing, and you should, because behind all these numbers are not just abstractions, but are people's lives on the one hand, and frankly, vested interests on the other. That's why this is the way it is, right? Um, so it's hard to shift it at scale. Um, but if you thought that was just sort of okay, or didn't worry you too much, let me worry you a little bit more, which is that, um, that we are spending $570 billion a year right, on subsidizing this system. This is money, it's not government money, let's just be clear, it's your money, right? And it's everybody's money in this room, at large scale, subsidizing the system that I just described, right? And when we run the numbers, it is hard to find more than a few percentage points of those subsidies that are directed to the good things of life, overwhelmingly, it's directed to the wrong things. When you do the maths, you will discover that the subsidies overwhelmingly go to a small, num a small number of large farmers, or they go to carbon-intensive, health-damaging um, products, and the meat and dairy industry are part of that. I don't want to vilify them in any way, but, but you have to understand that's where a large part of the money goes. Um, so our choices in public policy terms where we put our taxpayer dollars is precisely to the wrong stuff. Um, so um, some of you will have seen this, uh, and I just want to remind you, what would it cost us to start behaving differently? Economic governance, which is what this session, I think, was due to be about, um, as I read it, run into the red. Um, but uh, 
economic governance isn't again something that just sits there for everybody else to do. It also sits there for us to do with the choices we make every single day in what we buy. It also is a function of what we choose to put our savings into, whose pension fund is properly designed for the kind of food and land use system that we want. Hands up. Right, so I suspect the answer is nobody. Um, but we buy a £2.50 cup of coffee from Starbucks or from Pret, in my case, right? And the bad news is that, you know, roughly um, 11p goes to farmers of one kind or another, from the milk dairy producers to the coffee producers. 1p and the £2.50 go to, goes to the, to the coffee grower, just one pence. Think about that. Now, that's the bad news, right? The good news is that it would just take us paying £2.51 or £2.52 and you double that guy's income or that individual's income. So the potential, if we think about using the power of the market to change some of the externalities and make them internalities and doing so at a remarkably low cost for us as end consumers is incredibly high. Last slide and then I will um, hand over, uh, which is we in the Food and Land Use Coalition think that you can't just get to better economic governance by only having these abstract notions of transforming the world trade system or transforming global food subsidies or getting after you know, global value chains. It's too hard, right? And we will spend forever polishing the problem. And, and we are all incredibly good. One of the things we are best at in this room is being able to refine and polish the problem beautifully on a daily basis, right? We're exquisitely good at doing that, right? So our view is what we need to do is to get after some areas of big transformative action, not tinkering with the system, not playing with, let's just tweak it a bit, because you can't tweak the problem I just described to you any more than you could tweak the climate problem. So we need big and bold transformative, transformative areas of deep and fundamental change. This is the set that we think is at the heart of driving to a system that delivers the environmental health and, 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 and prosperity outcomes that we want to see. It's around changing what we eat, nothing new there. It's around driving to a different kind, and I think how I put it, you know, resource productive, resilient agriculture that has got regeneration and soil health at its core. We have got to get these forests under control. I mean, trust me, every year that goes by and another 20 million hectares go, and Greenpeace reports coming out, telling you that every single one of the major companies in the world that is working on their food systems cannot describe transparently what they're doing on the use of palm oil and the deforestation free supply chains. It is a crime, right? And, and we and our kids will pay for it, let alone others on the planet. The oceans are a huge part of the answer and dramatically underexamined and underdeveloped as an approach um, we have got to build this from the farmer up, right? It cannot just be those of us hanging out and buying a slightly better form of latte. This has got to link to the reality of farmers' lives, large and small. Farmer suicide rates are up across the world and we have to do something very profound to shift that. And then, and then finally, um, the, the system is rigged. Right, and I will put it as simply as that. It is dramatically over-concentrated, it is unbalanced, and it is putting risk systematically, systematically on the backs of those that have the least capacity to bear it. Um, and we have got to take specific concrete actions to change the way that operates. So our proposition as the Food and Land Use Coalition is let's not just talk about the abstractions. We will have the big numbers. We will try and disrupt how people think about the need for deep change right, and shake them out of their complacency and shake ourselves out of our complacency. 
And then we're going to get to work on specific, concrete, tangible themes turned into tipping points, turned into specific proof points of where and how we drive deep change in the world. Thank you all.